for uh, inviting me to uh, give this uh, presentation. Uh, actually, uh, <clears throat> Dr. Kooten uh, presents a lot of information that is very pertinent uh, to what I'm going to be talking about, which is uh, carotid artery disease in women. Okay. And, uh, you know, I don't think uh, that uh, we have been paying enough attention to uh, this particular topic. Uh, I mean, what is this? Just this one. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Okay. All right. Don't so, um, let's see. When Dr. Coulter asked me to give this presentation, uh, I was uh, a little bit, this was a big challenge, no doubt about it. And the reason for it is because, uh, number one, I didn't want to be biased in any way since I work with Dr. Coulter and I certainly don't want her to look uh, at me in a negative way. And I've been also married for 40 years plus, uh, and so I have my, uh, uh, inclinations as far as women are concerned. They're all positive, I can assure you that. So, um, but what is even more important is um, I tried to search literature on this particular topic and there was not much available. So I called a good friend of mine, Anne uh, Abbott, and she's a neurologist from uh, Melbourne, Australia. And uh, she has published close to uh, 100 manuscripts on carotid artery disease. Okay, so I, I said, Anne, can you help me with this particular topic? And she didn't respond for a while, and then she answered, I have nothing on it. And she's a woman, she promotes uh, treatment of carotid artery disease, identification of this, and she said, I have nothing. Can we work on it together? So, and you can see here from the information that she has published extensively, a lot of citations uh, and so on. So that just tells you how frustrating this topic is, an under-evaluated, under-diagnosed, uh, and uh, under-treated. So as far as uh, cerebrovascular disease is concerned, there are 16 million strokes per year occurring worldwide. And um, the outcomes in a lot of instances are dismal. Only one-third recover, one-third die, and one-third remain with a significant impairment. So, Obviously, it is extremely important, regardless of the gender, to look at this in more detail, pay attention to it, establish early diagnosis, and treat as soon as possible. Now, some of the facts about incidence of carotid artery disease in women. Uh, the understanding of cerebrovascular disease in women, as I mentioned before, is hampered by paucity of studies that are dedicated to this particular topic. Actually, none of the studies is dedicated to this particular topic. And the number of um, female patients that have been included in a variety of studies is uh, extremely low because most of the studies are biased towards men. And there are a variety of reasons for that. One is lack of attention, lack of diagnosis, lack of complaints. Uh, hormonal differences and anatomical differences and a variety of other things that we still don't know about. So there is no doubt there is a tremendous need for additional studies paying attention to this particular problem. But there is some information that we have clearly available. That women have uh, fewer strokes than men, as far as uh, we know, and uh, have a uh, better long-term prognosis after strokes or TIAs, which is a good thing. Um, the gender differences are particularly more striking in favor to women with the age of less than 75. Once we pass that age, then obviously hormonal benefits are no longer present there, and uh, there are other factors that play a significant role, hypertension, atherosclerosis, and so on. And as far as the number of CV risk uh, uh, are concerned, is pretty close to equal between uh, two genders. So that is particularly true for um, uh, smokers. What is also very important is that diabetes starts rising after that age in women, and it's more prevalent, prevalent in women than men after age of 75. And obviously that might also have something to do 
with weight gain in certain instances. Also hypertension and hyperlipidemia after the age of 75 are significantly more important, uh, not just for women, but for both uh, genders. One thing that greatly differentiates women from men is one particular entity or condition that has nothing to do with atherosclerosis, and that's uh, fibromuscular dysplasia. And I'm not going to go into details. There are several types or varieties, some of it affecting more intima, some media, then you have combinations. It could be a focal disease. It could be more uh, extensive or diffuse disease with beaded appearance. Uh, for those in layman terminology, it would look similar to, a, let's say, a peanut shell. You have septations in there. And uh, that could lead to a variety of uh, problems. It's uh, very commonly seen in um, uh, families. And the most common representation is uh, in patients with uh, renal ar artery stenosis causing renal vascular hypertension. But it's not only stenosis, but also it can lead to aneurysm formation and dissection. So uh, this is particularly cumbersome and concerning in patients with uh, cerebrovascular involvement in fibromuscular dysplasia. And uh, so this is the best that I could come up with as far as this particular entity is concerned uh, in, in women. And uh, this is from the United States uh, Registry on Fibromuscular Dysplasia. Now you can imagine the whole United States investigators were involved in this and they only gathered 447 patients. Obviously this is probably just the tip of the iceberg. But what you can see is renal artery is more commonly involved than any other one. But external carotid is very, very close to that, as you can see. And then followed by uh, lower extremity uh, and then the other arteries as well. Now, this might be a little bit difficult to read, but you can see that uh, this occurs significantly earlier than what you would see in atherosclerotic disease. And also, this predominantly is a female uh, gender pathology. And uh, so that is certainly of great concern. Hypertension, strokes, TIAs are classical manifestations when you have uh, fibromuscular dysplasia. Now, fortunately enough, this condition is not like atherosclerotic disease. It's relatively easily treatable with good outcomes just with plain all balloon angioplasty. You break those septations and you have very good results. Occasionally, particularly in more extensive disease and more complex involvement, you might actually cause a dissection and stenting might be indicated only in that kind of uh, circumstances. But typically, balloon angioplasty by itself is sufficient, particularly in uh, renal vascular uh, disease. Now, of course, when you have occlusion, dissection, uh, aneurysm, then other treatments are necessary, and uh, balloon angioplasty is not the best option. Now, let's look a little bit about atherosclerotic disease of the carotid arteries in both genders. And uh, a lot of us are focusing on what we see in coronary disease, and we try to attribute that the same thing is happening in cerebrovascular disease. We know that 95% coronary artery stenosis will very frequently uh, cause significant symptoms and also will produce abnormal stress tests, whether it's treadmill or PET or whatever else. Now, with carotid artery disease, as far as the event rates are concerned, TIAs or strokes, there is no dramatic difference between uh, 60 to 79% stenosis versus 80 to 99% stenosis. And uh, that led to further studies that elucidated this problem a little bit further and um, refined the answers, and we'll talk about it very shortly. But uh, what you can see here, one of the important factor is it's not that Severity of stenosis is the main predictor of event, but plaque burden. And what kind of a com uh, composite you have in that plaque, whether it's liquid, whether it's fibrous, whether it's calcified, 
necrotic makes a big, big difference. Uh, and uh, so what we talk about, what we talk about coronary disease, similarly so, and even maybe more importantly so, vulnerable plaque is extremely important predictor in events with carotid artery disease. So let's talk a little bit about treatment. And as we know, we have a surgery as an option, endoterectomy, uh, CEA, it's commonly called, a variety of techniques available, uh, removing the plaque, uh, uh, performing what we call patch angioplasty, adding extra material, and uh, eversion, uh, atherectomy, those are the options and uh, techniques that currently exist. And then carotid artery stenting that has been popularized for the last two decades or so, and of course, medical treatment. Now, as we'll see, medical treatment is becoming more and more important in the treatment of um, this condition. However, there are significant differences, as um, Dr. Kutten already mentioned in peripheral vascular disease, uh, particularly related to the lower extremities. Um, again, we don't have enough of women in those trials to clearly state that one particular therapy is better than the other. So interestingly enough, aspirin in previous studies didn't show to be greatly of benefit in women with symptomatic carotid stenosis, not as much as in men. And uh, uh, so that was certainly very disappointing. Now, ticlopidine, which was one of the earlier antiplatelet agents, um, also didn't show significant uh, uh, benefits in, in women. So uh, until the so-called NASET and ECAS trials, uh, and you can see dates, that's 1999, we uh, did not have a clear-cut evidence that surgery is of benefit, regardless of the severity of stenosis in women. So in both trials, it was shown that if women presented with 70 to 80 percent carotid artery stenosis uh, with ipsilateral moderate stroke. So now we are really reducing the number of women that would be candidates for this or with stroke or TIA. If that occurred within two to three weeks, then, then they benefited from CEA. There were no other benefits if they were outside of this uh, margin of uh, evaluation, which was kind of disappointing to a certain degree. However, that did not stop a lot of surgeons in performing carotid endoterectomy on thousands and millions, actually, in the worldwide patients that might not have been benefiting from this procedure. Now, um, uh, there are other gender differences that are important as far as carotid endoterectomy or surgery is concerned. Women uh, were hospitalized um, uh, for uh, strokes, and uh, those that were hospitalized for strokes had fewer endoterectomies. And again, it's not clear why. Whether they recovered faster, they, whether they didn't have symptoms, whether anatomically they were not favorable, or whether the surgeons uh, had certain bias, gender bias for whatever reason. Uh, <clears throat> not all of them were uh, Trump supporters, so I don't know <laughs> what was the main reason. Obviously, further studies are needed to uh, elucidate those differences and implications as far as carotid endorectomy is concerned. So obviously carotid endorectomy is less beneficial in women from the information that we have available than in men. Now another thing what's very interesting, and uh, again we don't have the answers, but restenosis after carotid endorectomy is uh, more common in women than men. And, um, uh, but important thing is that um, a lot of those women with restenosis remain asymptomatic, maybe because they're tougher or more stoic and uh, men are more whiners, I don't know, but uh, certainly that, this is a fact. So at the present time, with the latest knowledge that we have available, and what's very important when we talk about carotid artery disease, uh, approximately 75% of patients with carotid artery disease are asymptomatic. They have no symptoms. 
regardless whether it's evaluated by a cardiologist or by a neurologist. So it means that uh, if we don't evaluate them somehow with some other means, we're going to miss a lot of them just doing history. Physical examination is very important because if you hear a brewery, you should strongly suspect that there is significant carotid artery stenosis. So it's interesting now, I would like to uh, <clears throat> uh, mention one particular important aspect. Very few surgeons ever use stethoscopes. I have vascular surgical residents on my rotation and uh, the patient comes with me with uh, either for routine evaluation or evaluation of carotid artery disease and uh, the fellow or the resident sees the patient and I ask him, what did you find? He says, nothing. The patient is asymptomatic, there's nothing wrong with him. I said, did you put a stethoscope on the carotid artery? He says, well, you know, we, we, are, not, we are not asked to use stethoscopes. <laughs> uh, we don't know how to use stethoscopes. <laughs> so they cannot diagnose the condition. And this is one of the simplest ways how to establish diagnosis. Whether it's a carotid disease, whether it's renal vascular with abdominal brewery, whether it's a femoral brewery, and so on. So you see how important it is to do a proper evaluation. So at the present time, if you are asymptomatic, regardless of the gender, but particularly in women, the best medical therapy is the best option in asymptomatic patients with less than 70% stenosis. And you have to be able to control the risk factors, hypertension, atrial fib, smoking, cholesterol, diabetes, encourage patients to exercise, dietary restrictions, and pay attention to family history because this is extremely important. Actually, Dr. Kutten, I don't know if he mentioned it clearly enough, but the incidence of abdominal aortic aneurysm is uh, significantly higher in families. So I mean like fivefold higher than related to any other risk factor. So you have to ask about family history. Now what's very important is um, uh, transcranial Doppler is an extremely sensitive tool and indicator. And a lot of patients will have a shower of emboli, or we call hits on transcranial Doppler, if you, control, if you record it for a short period of time. And the patient will be asymptomatic, or relatively asymptomatic, but you can identify the lesion that's vulnerable and that can predict uh, stroke. And those patients would benefit better from carotid endotorectomy and or stenting rather than medical therapy because it identifies a vulnerable plaque. So we have to use this tool more frequently. So uh, another factor that's extremely important is follow those patients closely. Because if somebody comes with a lesion that's 50% and in six months or a year after that is 90%, this lesion is progressing very fast. Atherosclerotic calcified plaque cannot progress that fast. This is probably a vulnerable plaque that's laden with cholesterol and the necrotic material. So look at the homogeneity of the echolucent plaque. Let's talk a little bit about carotid artery stenting trials. Billions of dollars have been spent worldwide on this particular issue. And there are a variety of reasons. It's amazing, I mean, there is no disease that I know of where so much money and so many trials have been spent and we still don't have clear answers. Part of it, part of it is because there is a turf battle between interventionalists, cardiologists, radiologists, or neurointerventional radiologists, and vascular surgeons what is the best modality of treatment? However, when you look at all the carotid artery ascending trials, and I didn't include, this is probably less than half of them, you can see that over a period of time, the incidence of complications is going down dramatically. And this obviously has to do with a learning curve, us interventionalists learning how to do this procedure properly, selecting proper patients for it, knowing who's candidate, who's not candidate, but there is also improvement in technology, no doubt about it, because at the beginning we didn't have protection devices, now we have a variety of protection devices, the profile of the stents is significantly lower, 
And we know which patient is not a good candidate. As a matter of fact, this one shows you there are anatomic features that are classical, what we call a challenging arch, uh, calcified, uh, thrombus and uh, atheroma laden uh, arch. It would be a contraindication or looking for trouble if you're doing procedure. All the patients, uh, symptomatic patients within a short period of time, women, uh, not necessarily because of gender, but because they frequently are vascular pets and have all the challenges with tortuosity, with disease arch, uh, and uh, smaller vessels, diffuse vessels, vulnerable plaque, and so on. But, as you can see on the bottom, your experience, your volume, is an extremely important factor. As you increase the number of interventions that you have performed, the your complication rate goes dramatically down. So let's look at some of the uh, clinical trials and uh, see what are the outcomes. As you can see here on the bottom, when you do carotid artery stenting, there is a high incidence of 30-day stroke, okay? Uh, less than with carotid endarterectomy. But there is a high incidence of myocardial infarction in patients that undergo carotid arterectomy and less with carotid artery stenting. And I mean, this is understandable. Most of the carotid arterectomy procedures are being performed under general anesthesia. General anesthesia by itself in patients with significant coronary artery disease has its uh, um, deficiencies or problems or issues. So that, that, is, that is a fact. Now, this is disputable uh, by many interventionalists, and they will say, yes, there is a little bit higher incidence of stroke, but in all those trials, this was not statistically significant, which is true for some of them. And the second thing is, the great majority of those strokes were minor strokes, and uh, most of the patients recovered, while those patients that had myocardial infarction had a poor long-term outcomes. But, when we looked at uh, one of the more recent trials, which is a CREST trial, and uh, this was four symptomatic and asymptomatic patients, uh, <clears throat> huge number of patients were included. However, at the end, most of the patients were asymptomatic and lesser number was symptomatic. Only 35% of um, the patients in this trial were women. Again, giving you a lower number as far as information and analysis is concerned. And as you can see, periprocedural events uh, in women were, uh, were higher, okay? And that's, again, a factor to think about when you talk about carotid artery stenting. Uh, now, what we can see is uh, when you look at risk benefits, uh, carotid artery stenting versus carotid artery interrectum, you can see that it was a little bit, therefore, less favorable for women to undergo carotid artery stenting than men. Most of the other variables were pretty close, evenly split. Now, more recently, we have a, had a publication in New England Journal of Medicine on so-called ACT-1, which is asymptomatic trial. Huge number of patients, close to 1,500 asymptomatic patients, 62 sites um, in the United States. Uh, patients were randomized to stenting or carotid enterterectomy. Now, they were all asymptomatic. They were followed for five years, and uh, the outcomes were equal for both carotid artery stenting versus carotid endarterectomy, which is amazing because this is the first trial that clearly showed that it does not matter which procedure you do regarding women and men uh, would be of, of importance, particularly for women now, for the first time we have seen that um, the incidence of ipsilateral stroke uh, was significantly lower than in any other uh, trials uh, and better than with carotid endarterectomy. So this, this is an amazing uh, information that we have here, but obviously we don't know, we don't have all the answers, but we know that we learn how to do the procedure better. We probably scrutinize, including patients, a little bit better and uh, we treat patients medically better than we have 
in the past. So this is discordant with Crest and the other trials. And uh, obviously this needs to be revalidated again in the very near future and will be. But anyhow, uh, so uh, one of the factors that I always think is as important or even maybe more important than randomized trials or controlled trials, particularly when they're industry driven, is to look at the real life experience. It means us that perform procedures outside of the trial because that just tells you how it's being done uh, in a large uh, population of patients. So here is a review of 170 observational studies. And uh, what we can see uh, as far as differences between carotid artery stenting and endoterectomy is concerned, that if you are younger and you have a contralateral occlusion and you are a, a woman, you benefit from carotid artery stenting, uh, but if, um, if you uh, have some other comorbid conditions, and uh, again, uh, that's the great majority because only 23% were in this first category mentioned up there, then carotid enterectomy is better. So it means uh, I'm not exactly sure that CREST, uh, I'm sorry, that ACT-1 trial is clearly validating that statement that uh, uh, women benefit more from carotid artery stenting. So um, uh, there are other observational uh, trials that have been carried on, and the conclusion from those in huge number, over 5,000 patients, is that carotid artery stenting and ent uh, carotid enterectomy among Medicare beneficiaries, Medicare, that's all above the age of 65, were comparable. So you see, you see a little bit of conflicting information. But regardless of what the studies show, we have to deal with the reality. And the reality is that Medicare and CMS approves or disapproves certain procedure. And we have to follow those guidelines, us that are involved in performing procedures on those patients. So carotid artery stenting is only reimbursed for symptomatic patients at the present time if the stenosis is 70% or greater, which is a very, very small number of patients because, as you know, 75% of patients are asymptomatic. And uh, so we have to be aware of that. That's why the number of carotid artery stenting is dropping dramatically. When you have uh, symptomatic patients, and stenosis is between 50 to 70 percent uh, or asymptomatic, the only way how you can treat this patient with carotid artery stenting and being reimbursed if the patient is in some kind of a registry, which probably do doesn't exist anymore, or clinical trial, and there is only one, and that's CREST 2 that's ongoing at the present time, that is going to be the most extensive trial and the most costly trial, it will take 10 years I don't know how many millions of dollars or hundreds of millions of dollars this will cost, but the patients will be randomized to medical therapy, to uh, another group will be carotid artery, stenting with medical therapy, and the third one will be surgery with uh, medical therapy. And uh, we hope that this trial will give us more answers as far as benefits are concerned. There are also newer therapies included in this trial that we didn't have during uh, Act One or CREST trials and so on. So we will have some answers. And they were also evaluated for vulnerable plaque, which is very important. Uh, and I think we'll have more answers once this trial is completed. So in summary, the understanding of cerebrovascular disease in women is hampered, obviously, by a paucity of studies that are dedicated to this subgroup and more men are included and have been including in clinical trials. So uh, there is no doubt from all the information, whether medical treatment, whether surgical treatment, or carotid stenting treatment, women respond differently uh, to our treatment than men in carotid artery disease. And obviously there is need for additional studies and some of them are forthcoming. Thank you very much for your attention.